Hello and welcome to another Ancient Warfare magazine podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In this episode of the podcast, we'll be looking at Volume 9, Issue 3, The Mighty Rulers of Anatolia, the Hittites and their successors. For more information on the magazine, go into ancient-warfare.com. Joining me tonight is Joshua Browers, Murray Darm, Mark McCaffrey, Sean Manning and Stephen Weingartner. So for those listeners who've not read the magazine, let's start with who are the Hittites? Very briefly, you can say that in the first half of the late Bronze Age, you have four major uh, powers, which are the Hittites, the Egyptians, the Mitanni, and the Babylonians. And uh, about halfway through, the Mitanni Empire sort of disintegrates because of all the troubles that we will undoubtedly get to later. And then uh, it sort of shifts. The power vacuum is filled in with the uh, Assyrian Empire that sort of rises to the fore. Mm. So you have this late Bronze Age that's dominated by four major powers, largely with various hangers-on around it, uh, including Azawa in the west and uh, Ahiyawa in the west somewhere. Uh, whether they are Achaeans in the sense of Greeks is a, is a matter of uh, debate and, and how far they stretch and how small. Um, but you have these four major powers. So initially Egypt, uh, Mitanni, Babylon, and then further to the west, uh, the Hittites, and then halfway through, the Mitanni disappear, and they, that, that vacuum gets filled up by the Assyrians, and that lasts until about 1200 BC, when there's a, a big catastrophe that we also talked about briefly in the uh, uh, podcast on issue 9.1 on the fall of Rome, uh, where the, all these Bronze Age kingdoms basically collapse to a greater or lesser degree, including the Hittites, who uh, disintegrate. Um, and then that sort of paves the way for the early Iron Age with the emergence of Neo-Hittite kingdoms and uh, other peoples known from historic sources like the Carians and the Phrygians and the Lydians, etc., etc., um, all of which touched upon in the, in the issue. I think this way listeners will have some sort of idea of what we're talking about in the major uh, political players. These are all very land-based empires, aren't they? Except for Akiyawa. So is anything nice. certain over them them being more based around the sea, or is that you know is that just theoretical? The recent research and the people I've been talking to and et cetera, et cetera, are becoming more adamant than ever that Akiyawa was a fairly centralized Bronze Age Greek confederation dominated by a, a, a premier inter Paris, which would have been at Mycenae, mm. that, they, that they dominated most of the Aegean. And are, you, are you absolutely sure about that? Of course I'm not sure. No, 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 I'm, I, I, because uh, th these are ideas indeed that are floating around, and um, initially when the, idea, when the Ahayawa popped up, uh, there were some people that said, these be uh, Homer's Achaeans, and it's pretty sure now that they are indeed Greek, that they are Mycenaeans also by way of the, the structure of their names and that sort of uh, uh, stuff. Uh, Eteocles is, is attested in a uh, perfectly acceptable Mycenaean uh, Greek rendered in Hittite form, etc., etc. Um, but the problem is how to identify the, the kingdom of these Ahiyawa, and that might be uh, an island uh, off the coast of Asia Minor, it might be uh, some some place on the coast of Asia Minor, uh, the area of uh, Miletus or Ephesus or whatever, or it might indeed be somewhere uh, on the Greek mainland. But the exact uh, nature and size of the uh, Ahia Kingdom is still a matter of, of heated debate, as far as I know. But I just keep reading in you know in terms of books talking about the period, so sort of saying of course the islands are so close together. It seems like an assumed thing that, of course, they've got you know, naval trade going on in this kingdom, but it doesn't seem necessarily to be, you know, apart from, okay, there are you know, a couple of illustrations here and there, it doesn't seem to be a foregone conclusion necessarily, since all the no, others seem it... to be really centrally based in land. Because also with the uh, with the Mycenaean Greeks, uh, if you want to propose that Mycenaean Greece is Ahiyawa, you would have to uh, find some sort of evidence that it's a centralized uh, country in and of itself, and the evidence isn't really doesn't really exist for that. 
Uh, it has been argued by some people um, who have not been taken very seriously that uh, Mycenaean Greece was uh, a unified um, empire at one point, but um, that that the evidence for that is very very slight, uh, especially when you consider the autonomy of the different uh, citadels and the the uh, road systems and everything else. It, Okay, I respectfully disagree with that. If if Akiyama was not uh, a Greek realm, what the hell was it? And where was it located? Well, like I said, it could very well be just a part of uh, Anatolia or some islands or... I don't think that's tenable at all anymore. That seems to me to be a, a very old uh, <clears throat> conjecture that uh, most people seem to be rejecting lately. Such uh, as? Rich Beal at the Oriental Institute... Uh, Hittite experts like Theo Vandenhoek, Billie Jean Collins. Collins is, is very adamant that uh, Akiawa is uh, a, a Mycenaean Greek or let's say Bronze Age Greek realm. I think the evidence that it, uh, on a country that powerful, a nation that powerful, would be confined to the west coast of Anatolia, what with Arzawa there and uh, and Milwanda being technically owned by the Hittites, that that really leads to problems. I mean, who who or where would it have been? And and also in the uh, in the text, first of all, um, Kippalili Yuma banishes his wife Enti, the mother of his five sons, to Akiawa, sending her over the seas. So that would indicate that Akiawa was either in the islands or on the Greek mainland. No, I don't think that's that's uh, in any doubt. It's just a matter of the the scope and the scale of the uh, Akiawa lands. At one point, the Hittite king talks about the king of Akiawa appearing in battle against him with a, a force of something like a hundred chariots, which indicates a pretty powerful power projection ability. Maintaining a territory army in the field required a great deal of sophistication. I think that's a further sign. Now, I will admit that these translations have been disputed. Nevertheless, we have them there, and uh, we can talk about them in that light. My next question was going to be about um, what do we know about their society, uh, hopefully leading to uh, the clear tablets, because surely quite a lot of what we know comes from these clear tablets. Sean, you wrote an interesting uh, article in the uh, issue on okay. the... Um, Guards Row. Uh, Guards yeah. Row, uh, which has perhaps my most favourite uh, introduction of any article. Yeah, that is a good quote. Uh, Thanks for the, that uh, one. May he go pee? <laughs> so if listeners are curious about that, you have to buy the issue, sorry. As I understand it, at some point, one of the hit Hittite campaigns down into the upper upper Tigris, upper Euphrates, they decided the thing to do was to do what all the cool kids are doing, which was to have scribes writing in cuneiform on clay, imported or captured or fired or whatever scribes and set up uh, and set them up writing. Because this was often written on clay, not always, you know, they were writing on wax tablets and things like that as well. And because at some point Hattusis was burned and abandoned and left the town up with their, we have all of these archives and literary and copies of literary texts and things that we don't have for a lot of ancient societies. We do have these fragments of what looks an awful like uh, tactical military literature. In my article, I talk about the instructions for the border guards, which are this one incomplete copy of a text that uh, has all the rules for the procedures that the royal bodyguard have to follow every day. So first, for what they do when they're standing guard at the palace and people are coming and going. Uh, what to do when the king wants to go for a ride in his chariot to the countryside or to serve as a, a judge for cases and how to set up the uh, procession with the guards. We don't really have this kind of thing for classical antiquity, as far as I can recall, that gives this very detailed, very everyday picture of what soldiers in the standing army are spending most of their lives doing. But why would we have this text, really? Why would it be produced? It seems to be either you know something that could be used against 
their organisation, and you know something prime for you know knowing exactly how to you know uh, launch an attack on the on the king as he's out riding as such, or is it something that's being produced as an observation by someone who's you know critically observing it? Or is it really just a training manual? Do they need a training manual? Are there enough people reading at the time and who are going to read it being in a position of a guardsman? That gets into a really interesting uh, question. How, how extensive was literacy? Actually, can I just make it more, more complicated and say, I think one of the articles, I think in the magazine uh, for this edition, sort of gave the idea that there are a number of different dialects you know, going across the, the, the better word, the, the Turkish peninsula at this time. So exactly how much of the population would this particular dialect be used by in terms of the reading population? And in the Kakuli text, we have a Matanian of Indo-Aryan, perhaps, descent, yeah. who's writing in Hittite, but the Hittites don't have the words for uh, horse training, so he resorts to using Indic words. And uh, in the text, he says, he tells his Hittite readers, this means, or that means. In other words, he uses the Indic word and then translates it in the text for the Hittites. What's the language that's been used in Wallusia at the time as well? Because that seems to be related to the Hittite, but also... You know, well, there's the differences as well, and then yeah. You know. Depending on their ethnicity, they spoke probably a mixture of Luvian, Hittite, and uh, they might have spoken uh, Linear B Greek too. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's at least one theory. I'm not saying I subscribe to it, but that that whole of Western Anatolia was colonized to a certain extent by Linear B Greeks. And that's why we have the tradition in the Iliad of uh, the Trojans and the um, uh, Greeks being able to speak to each other. I, that might be fanciful, but uh, it's interesting anyway. We know that there were Mycenaeans in in, uh, in Western Anatolia, but there were loads of different peoples living there also. And one of the things that is usually underestimated is the level of uh, bilingualism. Uh, if you look at the historic period in Anatolia, one of the main characteristics, you no. Know, books and conferences have been uh, held on that particular subject, uh, that Greeks living in Asia Minor in the historic period were usually also bilingual, so that they would be able to, to converse at least some uh, some number of them, both in Greek and in Lydian, for example, which would have been the major language there. I don't think it's the stretch of the imagination to say that in the late Bronze Age a, a similar situation would have uh, happened, uh, would, would have occurred, where in a city like Milawanda, where you had a probably small population of Mycenaean Greeks uh, living with local uh, Lydian people or whatever, uh, where they would be able to converse with each other uh, using one language or the other. Um, I think that's also what sort of the idea behind um, the situation in the Iliad, because even though the Greek heroes are able to converse with each other, uh, Homer makes the point that when the Trojan army uh, bursts out of the city gates, for example, uh, there, there's a cacophony of uh, noises from the armor, from the lack of discipline, supposedly, but also all the different languages that they speak. Uh, yeah, that's a real good point. Yeah. So it's it's probably very varied, but people were able to communicate anyway because they, they learned each other's languages. Of course, as the language of diplomacy, they could always fall back on Akkadian, which kind of served the same purpose as Latin did in later periods. Yeah, or Greek in, in the eastern part of the Roman Empire, of course. Right, right. To go back to the to reading, uh, it's always been my understanding that because of the complexity of cuneiform, uh, only few people were able to actually read it. Uh, what I would imagine they would have done um, in the late Bronze Age with something like the Horse Trainers Manual or the, the Guardsman Manual is do what they also did in the historic period. Uh, texts were not written mostly to be read silently by somebody, but they were written to be read out loud. So I imagine that if somebody said, I need instructions in the way of horse training or I need to know what the, the duties are of a guardsman, a scribe would pick the necessary tablets and start reading 
you know, saying what do you want to know precisely, and then reading the the relevant passage out loud. That's been sort of a bit my understanding because also royalty usually didn't uh, learn to read or wasn't necessary for them to 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 read or write because they had scribes do all that. There has okay. been a kind of a, a pushback on the idea that Akkadian cuneiform was inherently so difficult that only uh, only a tiny, highly educated scribal class could read it. Because if you're willing to use the system in a relatively alphabetic way, so mostly the syllable signs, uh, you can get away with about a hundred signs with not all that many different readings. Say, a bit before the Hittites come around, we have things like these Assyrian trading posts or uh, Kadi in, uh, in Eastern Anatolia. The sites are just full of uh, tablets written in very bad handwriting and very small side inventory and mostly just letters and uh, business records and things like that. There are some people who'd argue now that say, at least in the places where Akkadian was a, a native language, that it probably wasn't unusual for, say, people to say the wealthier upper half of the population to at least be able to read uh, a simple letter or something like that. I don't know the level of, you know, how far down the reading goes, but it occurs to me that the people of the Bronze Age were inveterate record keepers. Accounting is the beginning of written language back then, and they kept records. Oh, my God, if you read the Ugarit uh, files, you find divorces and lawsuits and uh, angry letters about a wife treating uh, her husband badly and vice versa. So there must have been a lot of scribes around, if nothing else. Yeah, definitely. I mean, in Egypt, they were a separate class, even, I think, uh, if I recall correctly. So there, there, there were loads of scribes. <laughs> I don't think that's, a, that's a, an issue. We keep finding, uh, you know, Little deposits of written texts, you know, from, we'll put Vindolanda and all, you know, they keep turning up. We wonder how much more, how much more of these things are going to keep rolling out. Of the ground. That, they keep translating old texts that have been excavated decades ago but were never really mm. researched properly. So, well, they were saying the uh, last weekend actually at uh, the conference at the British Muse Museum about how much of a backlog they've got from the Vindolanda texts at the moment yeah. that they are just pulling them out by the bucket load, but. They just have got some, only a couple working on them, so. So we have got the same problem as they had then. Is we're not enough yes. people to read them. You generate all this yeah. stuff. Young people shouldn't learn to code. They should learn cuneiform. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll switch my Latin class over tomorrow. <laughs> I think the other the other thing that's always interesting is that the the single discovery is still enough to turn our knowledge or our supposed knowledge on its head. Um, you know, with with uh, the, the discovery of the Pylos tomb recently, you know, this that right. suddenly every everything's questions that we thought we knew uh, with a new discovery of a text or a, or a new translation of a text suddenly what's been accepted and what was the current theory is suddenly turned on its head by a single piece of evidence or a single interpretation, and and it's it just shows how um, fragile our knowledge is, which is something that you know. None of us really want to sort of walk around because we'd have to be on eggshells the entire time. Um, but it's it's so it's so fascinating, and you know the like with the Kakuli text where you've got a Mitannian writing for the Hittites. It's like, well, what are you doing there? Are you a traitor? Are you this? Is there, there are other you know? And there are more complicated explanations. Um, and it's so fascinating. And, and and getting back to you know why would you tell everybody what your royal guardsman's duties are? Um, because if they can read it, then yeah, as you say, you know, it's the perfect assassination plot um, tool. Because you know when they're going to be changing the guard and when they're doing all of that. So um, it is this. There's, there's something obviously going on that we don't necessarily have access to understanding yet, if we ever do. Unfortunately, doesn't have to be specifically an assassination tool. I remember, for example, with JFK, uh, his uh, tour through Dallas uh, was meticulously outlined in a newspaper, mm. uh, something like a week uh, before he was actually there. Um, so it, it's, you know, in three and a half thousand years, we don't learn a lot more, I guess. <laughs> but, 
when you write something down as well, and this, you know, there's a rigidity to it as well. You, you are lit, well, you're literally setting it in stone. So it does mean that once you've written down, and then someone says, actually, this is a better way of doing it, what you've written is out of the, or did stuff not change? They just kind of, all right, you might have, if it hasn't been uh, amended, the people, the next people along just do the same thing as was written down, and then they would learn, and then, and if it doesn't get written down again, the next person goes back to the start point that was written down. Because things were literally written in stone. You know. That's the funny thing about the one copy we have. It's incomplete, and it's clear that the scribe wrote it down partially and realized he'd left out some things, and then wrote some things in the margin. What kind of text he was working from, and was it some, something that we stuck in the back corner of the archives and nobody had read it for 100 years? Does that tell us something about the scribe, though, as well? I mean, going back to a, you know, an example of Vigilante tablets, you've got one of those that uh, quotes the Aeneid and, of course, gets something absolutely wrong, and that's been taken to mean that it's a, uh, a, a student copying down a text and getting something wrong, wrong in their, their student copy. I mean, have we got something like that happening with that, that text uh, from the Hittite collection that it is a copy being practiced one or a, a, an apprentice coming through, uh, you know, attempting to do the next version of the manual from the previous one. It's also the um, argument with medieval scribes is did they copy or did they conflate? Did, did you know, is your picture of a scribe someone with four manuscripts and they're writing one and that they're rather than copy a single manuscript, they are in fact conflating several. So the, the modern idea is that conflation is more common than previously thought. So the, the margin comment mm. is when you read another text and you go back to your copy and you realize, oh, I missed that bit out, or where you put um, you know, chapters that, that aren't necessarily concurrent in, a, in a, another manuscript, you put them together. Um, and certainly in the medieval period where handbooks, yes, they evolve, but they, in another way they don't. So um, I just did a piece on uh, Vegetius's um, Epitoma, which you know we start getting copies in the 7th century, and don't stop getting copies until the 18th century. Um, and it's always Vegetius, but there's bits and pieces added to show a contemporary um, contemporary relevance. I have a question for the uh, assembly here. When do you guys think that people, scribes, writers, went from being mere accountants to chroniclers, writing annals, and then to being historians. I mean, you have some tremendously interesting historical documents like the Egyptian accounts of the Battle of Kadesh and the annals of Mursili, things like that. But when do you actually get into people going into the field saying, I'm going to write history? Yeah, I think I think the I think the issue is of course that the the idea of history and who history's for doesn't exist. It's you know royal the the Kadesh stele is is a a royal account. Um, so there's but royal probably, accounts of a, royal of events. Are, are they history? Um, you know, yes, they're recording events. And like with Kadesh, is it you know it's the it's it's spin doctoring it at, uh, at mm -hmm. if, if you're going to be very generous um, and. <laughs> Um, that that is that history. I mean, we use it as a historical source. We use all of these documents as historical sources because we think of them historically. Um, and one of the things with with handbooks, obviously, is they're not meant to be history. You know, the the handbook on how to be a royal guardsman or how to train your chariot horses is not meant to be historically informative. It's meant to be instructional how to train your horse, not instructional for people in a future generation to realize how Hittites trained horses. Um, so I think in that, in that sense, we, we're, we're in a way, we're un, unable to access when does history start because we are looking at things from the historian's perspective as opposed to we're all royal scribes looking for that, you know, and it's the same with linguistics and philology. If I want to look for an obscure word on, on horse you know, stuff, he says, not having the word, um, I would go and find it and I would show my erudition by knowing another language. Um, and that's not historical. It's, it's you know, an erudite horse guy. I have 
just finished working on the extra content uh, for the for Ancient History magazine, which is which is something the Kickstarter backers is going to be are going to be uh, receiving uh, some of them at least. Um, and uh, one of the articles in there by Sean Hussman uh, is on uh, Herodotus as uh, not a historian as such, but as an investigative uh, journalist. Ah, that's because interesting. Because he, he, back when he was writing, history did not uh, exist, and he, he's considered the father of history. Um, but what he was doing is more to what a journalist does than, uh, more similar to what a journalist does than what, uh, what as we would describe it, a historian mm -hmm. Um, uh, writes. He he has sort of human interest stories and some gossip and uh, local folklore and all that stuff. And that isn't too different from from what you would see. Uh, just you know, folklorists and whatever uh, writing down and, and what a journalist today would do. Uh, he, he he does interviews with people to to find about find out about Marathon. Uh, he goes to Egypt and writes a sort of. An ethnographic, uh, very lengthy chapter on on those people. Um, so yeah, history is a bit, uh, difficult as a concept to put back in in ancient times. In I that think, sense, especially in the early period. In that sense, wouldn't it be Thucydides really who sort of takes on the the narrative as such properly? Oh, he makes a specific point of writing not for the immediate present, but for the uh, for forever. Basically, and he's probably writing that to go against Herodotus, maybe, because Herodotus' text was being read out uh, about the time that the city started writing his Peloponnesian War uh, um, um, overview. So, yeah, he may, he may have been the first to really say, you know, I'm just going to write, try to figure out the real story behind this, uh, even though he was not an impartial uh, writer, obviously. I've read that people are beginning to take Herodotus uh, more seriously than they used to. Is that true? Uh, are they beginning to think that he's actually more accurate than it used to be the case? It sort of goes up and down. Uh, these days, people are less dismissive of Herodotus than they have been for a while. Um, but it sort of, yeah, it sort of comes and goes throughout uh, <laughs> scholarship. Uh, there was a period in which it was very... Um, common to sort of dismiss everything that they're all said uh, and then archaeologists started discovering stuff that sort of confirmed some of the things that he was writing about. There's still a lot of a uh, lot of uh, stuff in the history that is clearly fabricated. Uh, also in some cases he, he picks different from different versions of stories he picks something that he personally likes. Uh, for example, uh, Ephialtes at, uh, at Thermopylae is a good example. Uh, he has this whole story about Ephialtes whose name later becomes a uh, byword for nightmare. Uh, which is probably completely rubbish, it's probably completely fabricated, because the Persians, with their army, would not have needed some sort of Greek traitor to lead them through a mountain pass. The Persians would have been able to find that perfectly by themselves, but it serves Herodotus's purpose of showing the, the Persians as basically inept without Greek help. That's why they have Greek yeah. advisors whose advice they continuously ignore. So you have a, a Greek coming to the, uh, the Persian king saying, oh, we should do this and that. And then the Persian uh. king says, no, I will not listen to you because I'm an obstinate Persian and I will do my own thing. And then, of course, he fails. And, you know, it turns out that if he followed the Greek advice, everything would have been fine. Uh, so there are those kinds of <laughs> elements in Herodotus's writing that are clearly, that, that serve his particular purpose. Uh, but there is stuff in there that is accurate as far as we know. Um, the problem is that for a lot of stuff that Herodotus uh, describes, the only source we really have uh, is Herodotus. Uh, so that, that is a bit of a problem. Uh, where you can, It's better if you have, for example, in, in later periods where you have uh, Polybius and Livy and uh, God knows who, Diodorus, Siculus, etc., uh, giving different versions of a particular story where you can where you can compare and contrast and try to figure out who, which sort they used and which is more reliable, etc., etc. Um, and you don't really have that for uh, Herodotus for a large uh, to, to a large extent. Um, so that's that's a bit of a problem. But you can sort of yeah. recognize the logo and of course that's something that in uh, scholarship on Herodotus is a very old tradition trying to, to, to sort of filter out the fact from the fiction in, in his yeah. uh, account. I think I mean, the other thing with the FELTs is it's, uh, his his end is an unfulfilled promise, which there aren't that many of in Herodotus. I think the Assyrian history that he promises is also something that he never follows through on, more's the pity. Um, 
but also I think the interesting thing about Herodotus is from an investigative reporter is you know that he's often been accused uh, of being naive at the very least, if not the father of lies, which is the opposite view, um, you know, father of history or father of lies. Um, but the, that whole idea that you know he gets told these things when he goes and interviews people, and he gullibly writes it down as if it's fact, you know, the flying snakes and and things like that. But there are ways to rationalise out what he says. Um, the yeah. hippopotamus is the hippopotamus is very interesting because what he describes is not a hippopotamus, but what he describes of what you could see of a hippopotamus is exactly accurate. And then all of the stuff under the water is completely sure. wrong, but then mm -hmm. he's been told by the Egyptians, presumably, that it's a water horse. So he, he describes a horse from the back down and what you can see when a hippopotamus is in the water from that up. So he describes the, the visible parts of a hippopotamus in the water accurately. So there's, there's, there's a rationalization you can make at work, um, but not that you want to make apologies for his... Uh, his writing, but there is certainly um, there's certainly a school that, that that likes Herodotus. I think Herodotus is a more charming writer than Thucydides is, um, yeah. and um, there's there's you know Herodotus is a mine of information that that archaeology keeps corroborating, um, which is which is always good vindication, not that it's a competition. Yeah, we can sort of circle back to the issue uh, using Herodotus because um, um, we, we had uh, the Hittites, of course, which we've uh, talked about extensively and with the catastrophe in around 1200 BC with, with the whole of the Mycenaean Hittites, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all those kingdoms collapsing, crumbling, or uh, entering in a, in a period, entering into a period of some instability like in Egypt with the third intermediate period, et cetera. Uh, all of that makes way to the early Iron Age, and um, in Anatolia you get the rise of the so-called Neo-Hittite kingdoms, um, and of course also the development of local, uh, different types of local peoples, including of course the Carians, to go back to Herodotus, uh, Herodotus from Halicarnassus, which was a, a Greek city in um, Caria itself. And one of the things that is touched in the issue is uh, the the problem of so-called carrying armorers. I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing uh, the title of an article by Anthony Snodgrass, because Herodotus claims that um, characteristic elements of the hoplite panoply, so the typically Greek uh, warrior panoply, let's say, uh, like shield blazons and a method of fastening uh, crests to helmets, etc., that those were um, elements that were invented not by the Greeks but adopted by the Greeks from the Carians. And this is something that a lot of uh, military historians focusing on, on Greece uh, are very quick to dismiss because they feel like only the Greeks could invent this sort of stuff for their own style of warfare. Um, and so when Herodotus writes this, they say, well, obviously, you know, this is not true because there is no archaeological evidence to corroborate it. And Herodotus came from Caria, basically, so maybe he's just trying to sort of, you know, increase his own standing or, or the importance of the, the country where he came from or whatever. Um, which is interesting, but it's uh, not completely, uh, doesn't seem, doesn't necessarily have to be completely uh, fabricated, uh, but it's one instance where it's very difficult to say, okay, we cannot trust Herodotus, but we don't really have another thing to, to compare it with. I mean, for example, uh, there is another archaic uh, uh, poem fragment that refers to uh, uh, carrying helmet plumes. So there seems to be some sort of connection at least in carrier with helmet plumes in the perception of the, the ancient Greeks of the uh, 6th and 5th centuries uh, BC. But once again, this is a bit of a problem with, with sources and source material. But I know that Sean wanted to say something about this topic also, so I will shut up. One thing we do know, because we have documents from Egypt and from Mesopotamia, is that certainly carrion soldiers are all over from 6th century onwards. There doesn't seem to be any, any reason to doubt this, the vision we get in Herodotus that by the 6th century or so, Carian soldiers are fighting in pretty much the same way as soldiers from the other side of the Aegean. It dates back even to the 7th century, of course, with the, the oh, men of yes. Herodotus talks about right, where yes, Ionian yes. Carians operate side by side. Got the, got the earlier issue, got the earlier issue on that, of course. For, 
this also came up a bit in that uh, Men of Bronze volume. Kurt Rafflebaugh's chapter in Men of Bronze looking at possible Near Eastern precedents for Greek warfare. He had a pretty negative view, but on the other hand, there hasn't been maybe as much work as there could be actually making sure that Greek warfare really is so different from what everybody else was doing. If we look through the the big names of the classic Greek historiography, pretty much all of them are willing to talk about barbarians who were hot lights or citizen soldiers or formed a phalanx or armed like Greeks, whatever that means exactly, at some point. The Greek sources themselves, uh, the idea that the way Greeks fight and the way other people fight is completely different and unrelated is maybe something they are willing to be a little bit flexible on when you help them down to it. The the Greeks were not so very uh, dogmatic as some modern historians are when it comes to uh, <laughs> Greek modes of warfare. The other thing, of course, is that the Greek warfare is so unsuited to Greece as, you know, same with chariots. I mean, if you were going to develop a mode of transport or even a mode of warfare, chariot and hoplite warfare are not what you would do as a, as a Greek. You would choose some form of mountain guerrilla warfare because of the mm -hmm. terrain. It sort of depends on how but, you interpret what Greek warfare was precisely, which is... A, <laughs> but I mean, in, term, no, in, terms of, in terms of getting back to your, your idea about the origins of those elements um, and those tactics, they are, you know, flat plane uh, mechanisms which make sense coming from Anatolia. Um, and so the adoption of them by the Greeks, absolutely, but it could be other things in terms of status and things like that. Um, but that that whole uh, problem of why they developed and how they developed um, is is still open rather than, as you say, it doesn't necessarily need to be dogmatic. That's one of the questions that we got sent in via the miracle of the internet via Twitter was how did chariots develop? The Hurrians are usually considered to have been the first to have uh, oh, uh, to have used I, the, uh, the chariot, the two-wheel chariot. Uh, so around 1700 BC, and um, the earliest chariot type things are the, the battle cars with four wheels that the Sumerians used in the third millennium BC, which is sort of a precursor. But Steve, the first thing when you're talking about chariots, actually, I don't think the Hurrians developed it. I think the Hurrians probably learned it from Indo-Europeans when the Hurrians were still up around the Caucasus before they came uh, into the Near East. But that's, I believe me, there's so much dispute on this that it's almost talking about it is uh, very difficult. What you have to remember about chariots is they were tactical level weapons. They were not operational level weapons. They were not used as an extension of operational art where you're uh, trying to be mobile over long distances like modern armies. Their context was being used in a specific area that was amenable to their use. Armies were infantry armies, and then they found a, a good open space for the chariots to operate on a tactical level. That being the case, I think it makes perfect sense to use chariots, say, in the Greek peninsula and other areas, because they wouldn't fight with chariots in the mountains. They would find uh, a plane or they could deploy their chariots in their phalanx. I think chariots were developed more and more the discoveries of, uh, of horse-drawn spoke wheel war chariots in South Central Asia is pushing the date of their invention back to before 2000 BC, at least right around 2000 BC. So I, I think it's becoming almost indisputable that they were developed up north that they came down and that the Sumerian battle cars uh, are something entirely different and were not probably very effective. I don't see how they could be very maneuverable with the four wheels, the big block wheels, and uh, the use of uh, asses to draw them. Once the chariotry was developed, and it was a process of development, I think what you had uh, going was a tactical level weapon that was used 
in squadrons in the space between armies in the battle space. Uh, it was difficult to commit a full chariotry force all at once because of that, because of the rules uh, of parallel battle. Most battles were fought as set piece battles in parallel. What you had at the Battle of Kadesh was two different styles of cherry combat confronting each other. Neither one was superior, but I believe that the Hittite model is eventually what won out. The three-man chariot, and then you go advance to four-man chariots, and then finally uh, as many as five men. In, in India, they were putting six men and more in chariots. And somebody talked about what caused the demise of chariotry. I think gigantism causes the demise of it. After a certain point, you can only put so many men in a, in a horse-drawn vehicle, and it becomes impossible to be effective on the battlefield. And that, with the rise of heavy infantry and uh, the use of iron, you can make armor instead of going through the laborious process of uh, making bronze. So you can have these effective infantry armies that pretty much dominate the battlefields all the way through the Roman period. Do you think that um, the uh, chariots would have actually been used that much against one another? I mean, since yeah. they've got so, so many different styles of like the three-man chariot of the Hittites, which seems to be either a lance or something that's being used there as the main major weapon, the Egyptians using the bows, that, you know, as a platform mobile across the battlefield, or the there's the suggestion that the Mycenaeans are using it just as a, a mobile troop carrier. Are they yeah. actually using chariots if it was as chariots at all? Or? Well, the first thing to say is is the uh, the Hittites uh, chariot captain was a bowman. Uh, okay. The word for the word for chariot captain is bowman. They have a separate word for when they added the spearman. The spearman was uh, the third man was added between the time of Seti the first and uh, the Battle of Kadesh. And it came as a surprise to the Egyptians at the Battle of Kadesh. I think it was an important innovation. It was made possible, I believe, and I've argued, by the bigger, more robust chariots that the Hittites used with the axle in the center rather than at the rear, which allowed for a more a ability to carry more weight. I think that those spearmen in the Hittite chariots served as, uh, in a manner of uh, panzer grenadiers or armored infantry, where the chariots would uh, ride into battle uh, and the uh, spearmen would alight, dismount, and they would either serve as uh, defensemen for their own chariots or swarm to attack the Egyptian chariots. The Egyptians also had a third man, but he was a runner. And that was a disadvantage uh, for the Egyptians because they could never go too far or too fast in the battlefield with uh, their, their man-at-arms running alongside their chariots to risk exhaustion of that man-of-arms. That is one reason why I think that the uh, brilliantly conceived tactic at the Battle of Kadesh by the Hittites was to put these three men in the chariots and they could uh, do a wide flanking maneuver with over 2,000 chariots, think of that, uh, emerging from the forest as they did. Uh, imagine being in the marching uh, Egyptian column and seeing 2,000 chariots coming at you. At a certain point, those chariots would have stopped. The third men with the pikes would have alighted. They would have gone out with those spears and started poking the horses with them, probably putting the spears into the spokes of the Egyptian chariot wheels. It would have been uh, quite devastating. Meanwhile, the uh, Hittite chariot captains would be uh, providing covering fire with their bows. The question is, is why didn't they win the battle? Well, actually, they did win it strategically, but they had a bit of bad luck. The darn column came in the nick of time and uh, saved Pharaoh's bacon. What we see after that is almost all chariot forces in the ancient Near East adopting the three-man model. The Egyptians obviously kept the two-man model through the Sea People's battles, and then I don't know what happened with them. They probably adopted a three-man model, too. But it's significant that the Sea People's chariots also had three men. How did you say this working? So the chariots would ride in, your, oh. spe your spearmen would al alight, then what would they form up as some sort of uh, light yeah. phalanx with the with the chariot behind, at which point they're almost like lightning infantry. 
What I think happened in the tradition of a paradigm of parallel battle is, is the armies would draw up opposite each other just out of bow shot. This would form a battle space, which you can almost measure about you know, 300 to 400 yards, whatever. Into that battle space would ride the chariots. They would come in in squadrons, and uh, they would fight each other. And their third men, runners or uh, mounted men dismounting, what have you, would also be fighting with each other. And in fact, in the Kadesh illustrations, we have a picture of Shardana swordsmen who are great chariot killers pulling a Hittite charioteer off of his chariot and slitting his throat. So we have an instance of swarming uh, infantry there. And it's significant at Kadesh, I believe, that when the Pharaoh launches his counterattacks, they make mention of his Shardana bodyguard joining him in that action. And I think what we're seeing there is his uh, Shardana infantrymen with their big round, almost archive type shields and their long pointed swords swarming at the Hittite chariots whilst the, uh, uh, the Pharaoh is uh, providing covering fire with his, uh, with his bow. And uh, you have quite an effective combined arms team there, which mimics very closely, or, or at least presages very closely, uh, tank uh, armored infantry action. You never send tanks in the battle without infantry support. And in the same sense, the ancient chariot forces would never send uh, chariots into battle without infantry support. But I think at a certain point, you, when the chariot clash is over, and one of the chariot forces is driven off, then the decision is decided by the uh, infantry bodies advancing into each other. And again, the, the Kadesh uh, illustrations are revealing in that regard, because what you see there very clearly are the, the Hittite and uh, Egyptian chariotry brigades battling each other in the, the battle space, and on either side of them, you see phalanxed Egyptian infantry. I think that chariotry was the core, but the arm of decision was the infantry. This was also sort of the criticism that people leveled at um, Drews's book, about which I've, I've talked before. Um, I, I, dis I disagree with Drews, too. And, yeah, everybody disagrees with Drews, I think. Uh, Drews, <laughs> for, for listeners who don't know, uh, Drews wrote a book about the uh, the catastrophe, uh, 1200 BC, uh, the end of the Bronze Age, uh, is the title, if I recall correctly, uh, in which he proposed that the uh, kingdoms of the Bronze Age basically lost because they were swarmed by barbarians from the north who used infantry and that their chariot <laughs> center arm armies couldn't cope, uh, which is basically nonsense because... Uh, all armies uh, throughout history basically have been uh, uh, infantry-based uh, exceptions. Uh, uh, I think what you do see is, is infantry more and more being used in conjunction with geometry, but it certainly did end geometry. It continued into the Iron Age. Uh, geometry was a major combat arm for quite a while. Yeah, the Assyrians, for example, they, they built these really heavy chariots at one point also, uh, well into the, uh, what was it, 8th century, I think. The depictions of Egyptian chariots with their two men and their runner are of the king generally firing from a moving chariot. Are you saying that the, the, the standard uh, was, for instance, for the Hittite chariots to stop their men to dismount and form up and therefore they were a stationary archery platform? No, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear. I think at some point the third man would have uh, leapt out. One of my other arguments is, is the battle speed of chariots. There was no galloping with the chariots. And I think they drove in collection. And I don't know if I need to, if I need to explain collection, please tell me. The whole idea was they would come, uh, a, a great chariot force crossing the battlefield would be coming at a very stately pace with the horses uh, trotting like Tennessee trotters or something like that. That that enhances the stability of the, of the, the platform. I also I also like the, the fact that for the Homeric picture of warfare, the the chariot keeps the infantryman who dismounts but loses the archer, um, which which is a sort of an interesting development linearly of the chariot warfare rather than um, you know and whether that's a uh, 
Homeric in terms of the Trojan War or 8th century kind of development. It's, it's interesting. It's probably the same. If you look at the evidence, uh, painted vases and, and frescoes uh, from uh, the 13th and 12th century BC and the 8th century BC, they're basically the same. So there's probably continuity there in just having a guy with a spear uh, on, a, on a chariot uh, riding around on the battlefield and then dismounting when he's near uh, the enemy and then fighting in, in the Homeric <laughs> manner. Um, at least that's my argument in, in my book. <laughs> <laughs> I concur. I concur. <laughs> so we have a decent, a reasonable amount of evidence for for bows and arrows in uh, the Mycenaean Mycenae context. We have that oh, yeah, one yeah. Uh, seal or whatever that shows uh, a lion hunt. So clearly they were practicing archery. Area. No, no, no. That definitely. Uh, but there's just the 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 big fresco where we have where we actually see warriors. They're guys with spears. Um, and there's also the 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 grave steely, of course, of a guy running another guy down with a with a lance from a chariot, which is uh, not unique, but it is uh, uh, remarkable. Um, but yeah, no. Uh, those those scenes, those let's say near eastern. Style uh, scenes of uh, men hunting uh, with bows and arrows on chariots. It's uh, yeah. For that picture that's often read as a, a chariot lancer running down a man on foot, I'm with Dan Howard on that one. That probably it's probably the long straight thing is supposed to be the reins of the chariot, and he's clearly chasing. Maybe maybe he is chasing down that guy on foot, but. I, I don't think I don't think he's supposed to be chasing down with a lance pouched under his arm like some kind of late medieval knight or something. Mm -hmm. It's the only thing from the Mycenaean period that we have that that sh shows something like that. So yeah, if it's uh, it's again it's the Herodotus problem. Let's say if you have one source, it's a bit difficult. <laughs> How did they pay for all the? Uh, I mean, they, they, the chariots must have been uh, a standing force. If you have 2,000 chariots in the field, that's 4,000 horses. That's even more that you've got to have stabled, trained. Presumably, these are all specialized. Uh, yes. You're not just getting any old levies and stand, tell him to stand there with his spear. And um... uh, According to Beale, uh, the Hittite king at Muatali had 3,500 chariots at the Battle of Kadesh. He committed his reserve, his tactical reserve, midway through the battle, he points out that there was 2,000 of those were a permanent standing chariot force. Uh, there were elite chariots called, uh, elite chariot fighters called the golden chariot fighters, but the state supported uh, the, the bulk of the force, and then um, allies also had their own chariot forces. The, I don't know about the other countries, but uh, the Hittites had a very complex state-supported horse breeding, raising, procuring system, uh, and they did have a standing army that was augmented in times of war by levies and allies. In case of the Mycenaeans, the uh, Linear B template suggests that there's a mix of, of public and private uh, means. So, for example, you have the Hecatai, who are the, uh, the, the chariot warriors, uh, and there are linear B tablets that say that the the palace provided uh, one wheel and one horse to Hecata so and so, uh, and the idea is that the Hecatai probably um, maintained their own chariots, but if they needed something specific, the palace could sort of make a donation in exchange for their military support. Uh, so it's sort of a, a mix of of private public funds. The the records at Pylos. Do, do they indicate that those chariots were owned by the state and stored in warehouses in a dismantled uh, condition? No, I, as far as I know, there are no tablets that say anything about where they are being kept. Uh, which is the, the, those tablets are on one hand they have a lot of details, but they're always infuriatingly incomplete. Of course, uh, we just have that palace sending out uh, bits and pieces of equipment to uh, certain. Okay. Uh, so, and the idea is that 
this was a, a mixture of public and private means and probably also part of the soldiery that the palace sort of ruled top down uh, with the, the king and his bureaucracy uh, sort of appointing uh, Hecatai as commanders of particular posts and then Hecatai had to pick their own sub-commanders and their own, levy own troops and that sort of stuff so you would have this sort of top down arrangement where people sort of uh, delegated obligations and uh, downwards in a particular manner, but they could always fall back on the palace if they were higher up, let's say, if they needed something specific uh, that they didn't have or, or that they wanted in exchange for a military service or whatever. That was sort of the idea. What happened to the Hittite Empire? I would say they were destroyed quite suddenly uh, during the reign of Shtupululiuma II by uh, uh, Kashka barbarians invading from the north. They sacked uh, Hattusha, and uh, sea peoples coming in through the south along the coast. Uh, we do have letters uh, being written by Shupaluliuma to Egypt, uh, asking for grain to be sent, that there was a state of emergency in the kingdom, and then all of a sudden, nothing. When you say all of a sudden, how much is all of a sudden? Uh, I think that the sack of Hattusha probably happened quite quickly, overnight. I think that uh, Casca probably saw what was happening with the sea people swarming in through the south, and they, they made an opportunistic invasion, and they sacked Hattusa. It wasn't the first time that Hattusa had been sacked. I think that probably happened quite quickly. And again, uh, uh, right before that happened, uh, Shupaluliuma II was writing letters to uh, Egypt, and he also mentions a big sea battle being fought around Cyprus, and the Hittite navy was basically farmed out to the Brooklyn people. And apparently they lost a big sea battle off the coast. So something was going on and something was happening quite quickly. But, you know, how long it took for the sea peoples to destroy those kingdoms, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I did notice the article by Constantine Nassau. He, he thinks that according to the latest archaeological results, Hattusis was abandoned first, and then at some point, not too long after. I mean, uh, yeah, that sounds plausible too. I, I, you know, the idea that remember with Ugarit, uh, all of a sudden they're they just are burned, it's destroyed, and that's just south of uh, the Hittite realm. So things were unfolding quite quickly, I think. Yeah, there it's it's basically the same picture as elsewhere in the Eastern Mediterranean, where you can you can, you get a sense of the sources that there is this this relatively sudden upsurge of of trouble, of of people on the move and of them not really knowing how to cope, and then there is you have these these half panicky documents, and then it sort of ends all of a sudden. So yeah, and even up. To, does seem to be sort of uh, uh, relatively swift, whatever it was that, that destroyed. I mean, the destructions are all human uh, attribute, uh, attributable, of course, but there was loads of stuff happening. Um, Eric Klein's book, that we already mentioned um, in a previous podcast, 1187 BC, gives a, a pretty good up-to-date overview of uh, scholarship in, in this field, I think. so. To get a sense of the drama of the period, you have those... Uh, messages being recorded at Pulos about, you know, watchtowers, uh, lighting fires, uh, people coming down from the north, and then this kind of rolling tsunami that seems to, you know, just move inexorably uh, across the landscape and the oceans. And, you know, and then you have that great, wonderfully written uh, Egyptian text where he talks about the peoples of the sea made a conspiracy in their islands. They came before us. The flame was lit in Anar, Amor. Uh, nothing could withstand us. We have laid our plans. I mean, that's pretty dramatic stuff. And at the same time, of course, where one thing ends, another thing continues. I mean, uh, in the case of the Hittite Empire, when it collapses, when it disappears, you have the, the emergence of these these new neo-Hittite kingdoms, mostly city-states, basically, that emerge afterwards. So from the ashes rise different uh, phoenixes, and that's the same throughout the eastern Mediterranean, of course. Um, so it, it's not... A definitive end, let's say, uh, just an end of this particular social political system that was in existence right. in the Bronze Age. I think we should leave things there. Um, 
I'd like to thank Joe Show, Murray, Mark, Sean and Stephen. In the next episode of the podcast, we'll be looking at the first Punic War. If you've not read the magazine and would like to swat up, don't forget you can go to ancient-warfare.com to purchase your copy of the magazine. I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.